Up next is Ashoka, the emperor of good and evil. We have Charles Allen and Renuka Narayanan. Good afternoon to you all. Um, and thanks to the Hindu for enabling us to meet like this. I'd like to uh, first of all ask if everybody's read this particular book that we are going to discuss today, or rather have Mr. Allen talk about today. Has everybody read this book? Oh, great, because that makes my task easier. <laughs> I'll ask Mr. Allen to talk about this amazing story that he's worked very hard to research. And it's a double whammy in some ways because it was, it's a story of, it's a, you know, it's a very deeply and uh, systematically researched story that Mr. Allen's, um, you know, prepared for us in this book, Ashoka. The Search for India's Lost Emperor. And the story it tells is about a very difficult and sustained search by at least 300 years. Well, I, it's a thrill for me to be here, particularly because when I see so many young faces, I think it's, when you go to a literary festival in England, it's full of geriatrics like myself. And uh, it's a real thrill to see young people and to, and to see this, this sense of inquiry that there is here. Uh, and the other thrill that I'm finding here, and I'm sure some of you are as well, is just to, to realize that the English language is flourishing here in a way, in terms of literature and, and the imagination, in a way that almost is not in England except by the Indian writers. Um, so that's very thrilling too. <laughs> um, well, that was a very graceful compliment and thank you on behalf of our audience. Um, you have to actually share a number of things with us today, which I mean, we look forward to your sharing. But first, I um, would like to ask uh, the audience, I wonder how many of us know that uh, but for the British, we wouldn't possibly know about Ashoka. Oh, oh <laughs> Charles wins. I said, everybody knows, and he says, nobody knows. Oh, well, that's how many people? Count, please. That's about 15 hands or 20 hands. That's, it, it, that's not bad. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Out of 1.2 billion, that's not bad uh, yes, at all. I, I think it's one of these paradoxes that um, very often change comes from external influences. Uh, I mean, if I look at, the, look at England, you know, the, the, the greatest change that we had in a thousand years was the invasion by William the Conqueror. And it brought in Latin, it brought in uh, the rule of uh, Lex, Lex Romana, etc., etc. And although there was massive uh, injustice, I mean, all the, the, Ro uh, the Normans took over the lands, and indeed in, in the West Country, where I've spent the last few years, there are families there who are occupy that land ever since 1066. And that privilege is expressed in terms of those Normans, the sons of those Normans, going to Eton, going to Trinity College, joining the Foreign Office, whatever it is, and ruling us. And as you know, part, a, large, a large part of our cabinet is made up of old Etonians. So it's not just in this country that you have this sense of uh, an ossified, dare I say, uh, a dynasty which, which rules the land. And, uh, we were joking to us uh, uh, earlier that I, ha I had Object a dear friend. Object to ossified. <laughs> ossified is an unfortunate <laughs> word. I think I meant a rigid uh, system. Um, we disagree profoundly about this. Uh, I, I had a dear friend in, 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 in Mumbai who died recently. And we always used to tease each other. I used to call her, uh, you know, oh, you Brahmins, you know, you are the oldest clothes shop in history. You've dominated India for 2,000 years, but we've also got to remember, if I can return the compliment, that uh, th these Brahmins were the people who actually enshrined the culture of the country. They, they kept it alive and burning. And, but, and so it, it, it is a two-way system. Uh, mm. we, we don't particularly want to go there in a political sense, <laughs> but I have to tell you that Charles Allen's guilty conscience speaking because he bashes Pushyamitra Shunga like anything. In his book, he um, calls him that anti-Buddhist regicide. And he says, 
uh, a lot of spleen for uh, poor Pushyamitra Shunga, who was just, I mean, by anybody's reckoning, just doing whatever somebody did, which was there was a feeble king, and he pushed him aside and said, well, now I'm king. Fair enough. And I think that's a point that we need to make. I'm very conscious. Um, I always take as my yardstick, uh, I'm a writer of history, not a historian, a writer of history. And I think we use that word history, we bandy it about too seriously. Uh, history is a minefield. Uh, I, I always look at the words of uh, Leo Tolstoy. History would be a marvelous thing if only it were true. <laughs> and, and basically, history is propaganda. It always has been, it always will be. We've got to look at history with an open mind. We've got to challenge what we read. And this, in a sense, is what happens when you get somebody like Sir William Jones coming to this country, which he does in, in, in 1783, and challenging the system. And I think he's very, he was a very lucky man, if I might begin with William. He's one of my great heroes, as Absolutely. well as Ashoka. In fact, I was just going to say that such a perfect quote coming as it does, you know, perfect quote about history coming as it does from War and Peace, which is what history is and how it's written. Uh, I think, you know, um, given the, the way this book has worked out, your book very clearly has some heroes and some villains. So it would be great if you could share with us you know, the story of the first hero, I think it's William Jones. Yes, yes. Um, William Jones is, comes here to make money. That's basically what the British were doing here at that time. They came here to make money. And uh, they plundered Bengal, as indeed many of you will know. And then they continued to that process. They tightened up their standards, but essentially that's what it was. So William Jones, he's a, he's a genius. He speaks 23 languages. And he was known as Oriental Jones because he'd, he was a Persian scholar originally. He also wants to be a judge. He's appointed high court judge in, in Bengal. And he says to himself, if I do 10 years here, I'll make enough money to retire for the rest of my life. And so he comes out here essentially to exploit India. On the other hand, on that voyage out, he decides he's, he wants to do something positive, And he sits down and draws up a list Famous list, 23 desiderata. My object in coming to India will be to discover Asia in all its aspects. And he comes here with this attitude of mind, which is not like his colleagues. He really wants to discover India, everything about its culture. And he makes that breakthrough, which is making friends with Brahmins uh, in, outside Calcutta, uh, uh, famously Radhakanta and others, who teach him Sanskrit. And the doors of Sanskrit, that library of Sanskrit, are open to him in a way that they have not been to any other European previous, uh, since, previously. sorry. And he suddenly discovers that Sanskrit is not, as he's been told, barren of all, I mean that Indian is not barren of history or barren of culture. It has a marvelous uh, culture, a huge uh, library of plays and poetry and mythology, um, which st uh, staggers him. And he writes home to a friend, I am in love with Krishna and the gopis. I love that phrase. And uh, famously, of course, he translates works. And one of the plays he translates, uh, written by a 17th century, uh, seventh century playwright, um, I would, oh, I forgot the name. Uh, I know it. This, this is this, it's, no, it's actually, uh, I translated in England, the story of the ring. And it, in that, it's a story That's of, Shakuntalam. Oh, Shakuntalam. Um, well, the, 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 the names I'm looking for actually are Chanakya. It's a story about Chanakya and a rival uh, Brahmin oh, uh, counselor. Oh, oh, oh. I, I think it's called the ring, actually. And somebody will shout it out in a minute. Thank you. <laughs> Rudra Rakshasa, that's the one. The Thank political you. play. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. I'm sorry, my brain is starting to frazzle a little bit now. Mm. Um, and, and he finds these names in it, Chandragupta. And one of the objects, one of the 23 desiderata that he wants is to establish a chronology in India that he can link to a chronology in Europe. I think it's very interesting how he goes about doing that because he looks for cross-references in Greek literature and in particular it would be fabulous if you shared with our audience 
how they locate Pataliputra. There, there are these two stories, yes. I mean, he knows that there is this legendary place called Pataliputra. Uh, and nobody can establish where it is. And at the same time, there is this great ruler, Chandragupta, much admired, not so much because of the king, but because of the Brahmin ruler. I mean, the Brahmin counselor, uh, who, of course, is, is that famous character, Chanakya. Um, also, Kautilya. I'm not quite sure which is the favorable name at present. Um, but anyway, the, the author of that marvelous treatise on, on political economy, uh, Arthur Shastra. And so um, Jones is looking at this and wondering what it's all about. And then he goes back to his own scholarship and he remembers that, of course, Alexander famously intervened in Asia and his troops finally rebelled on the, on the river Bayas and they turned back. And Alexander goes on and dies in, ba in Babylon in 323 BCE. Now, there's a young man, a young mercenary from India who switches sides. And his name is Sandro Kotos. And it is um, through that reading that play that um, William Jones makes the breakthrough. Sandro Kotos is Chandragupta. And that gives us our first date. In, uh, that we can match European history with Indian history. But then, of course, we also have the Puranas, which famously people like Wilson and others were translating. And when I say translating, always with the help of the Brahmins. Um, we always we'll leave them out for a bit. Wilson takes the credit, but of course, he's got his Brahmins uh, translating his work for him. And this is always true in Indian history. One of the sad things that happened in this book is that my, Indian, my English publisher said, it's a wonderful book, it's far too long, it's very boring, and there are far too many Indian names in it. <laughs> <laughs> and I was saying, well, it's about Indian history. And so, to my shame, because I was desperate to finish the book uh, for, for complex personal reasons, I thought I was dying at the time, um, I, I, I cut quite a lot out and I bitterly regret it because this book is sold here and not in England, or indeed in America. The Engl English are not interested in uh, uh, Indian history, sadly. Uh, well, uh, they uh, played a magnificent part in relocating bits of the lost jigsaw. So after William Jones, I think the next two big heroes in this uh, trail of finding Ashoka are a certain young man called James Princep. And you must tell us his story, if you yes. please. And again, when I talk about James Princep, uh, let's remember also that his translators, famously, I mean, not famously, Forgotten is a translator who actually works with him to translate the Ashokan Edicts. And actually, he's a Sri Lankan. He's actually a, a refugee from Sri Lanka who has turned Christian. But he's the man who actually says, hey, no, I know this. I know this. This is actually part of our history as well. And, and I'll come to that in a minute. But William Jones, I'm so pleased that in Kolkata today, there's a, rail, there's a railway station called Prince Abgad, and there's a memorial there. And uh, I'm pleased that Kolkata recognizes the part he's played in the recovery of history, because that is what's happened, essentially. Um, we had this period uh, uh, um, for about 40 years when the British were here, when we were dissing, if I can use that modern word, dissing Indian history. You know, famously, Macaulay said there is no Indian history, there is no Indian culture, and that ghastly 80, uh, minute on education. Um, and that comes because there's a man called James Mill who is teaching all the, uh, all the Bengal civil servants that there is no Indian history and no Indian culture. Uh, and sadly, this is then countered by this small group of people in Calcutta originally, working with Indians to recover Indian history. And James Princep, he comes out to India to make money. Of course he does. Uh, he sees himself as a scientist. He's not interested in Sanskrit. But he's, he, he wants to study Indian science. And he is given the job of helping uh, Wilson at the, at, the, at the Mint. He gives us our first East India Company coin, because he's, he's working for the, for the Mint in Calcutta. But he's getting all these coins together. And he's discovering that there are the wonderful, wonderful um, dynasties of coins, but nobody sat down and worked out who these dynasties uh, relate to. We have in the Puranas these dynastic lists. We have the Mauryans. We know they rule for 137 years. Chandragupta, Bindusara, Ashoka, and then confusion. 
So something odd happened there, but there's nothing else. Why is Ashoka written down there as Ashoka Vardhana, Ashoka the Great? The, um, the oh, Hindu texts have nothing to say about Ashoka. There is this vast silence. It's, it's, no, it's a mystery. Nobody in India two centuries ago knew anything about Ashoka. It's an extraordinary fact. Englishmen, Indians, nobody in India, and yet all around India, to the north, the Sri to Lankans, the east, and the, the Thais, west, the Cambodians. Something strange has happened here. And of course, that process is the fact that Buddhism has flourished and then disappeared within India. And this, of course, brings us finally to James Princep's great discovery, which I suspect many of you do know about. Incidentally, for the Tamil speakers, may I say this? May I plug this? This is coming out in Tamil very soon, which I'm very thrilled about. And well done, that Tamil publisher. Thank you, sir. Thank you. <laughs> um, so, J James Princep, there is this strange language. There is this strange language appearing on these pillars here and there. This is a strange language appearing on great elephantine rocks here and there scattered across India. Nobody can understand what it's about. Um, the British, when they see it, say, oh, you know, this is Alexander the Great must have done this. But it patently is not Greek. And incidentally, the British archaeologists were always looking for European influences. Especially Winston Smith. <laughs> um, so we have this... We have this puzzle here, this great enigma. Here is this great column. And I want to, if I may, um, pay tribute to one Muslim that I, emperor that I regard highly. And I know he did a, a couple of naughty things. Um, Feroz Shah. Feroz Shah risk being regarded as heretic by finding these columns, bringing them to Delhi and putting them up. And putting them up near a mosque and putting them up in the center of his palace. He doesn't know what they are either. And indeed, when somebody asks him what they are, uh, he asks the Brahmins, they can't read it. And one of the Brahmins says, Sir, this prophesies that you will come to India and that you will be a great emperor. Um, a handy reply. <laughs> no, what was rather wonderful was to find in Patna Feroz Shah's own account of his discovery. And inside it is a poem which Feroz Shah has written in praise to this golden column which reaches up to the sky. It's, it's very, dare I say it, very un-Islamic. Uh, and uh, had, it, had it been known, I do wonder you know, what, the, uh, what some of the stricter scholars would have said. Well, I think the interesting thing here is that Feroz Shah had very good instinct. He could tell uh, an imperial creation when he saw one. And uh, that sort That's of worked very, very well. A very good point. And he respected it, uh, you know, from within, and he just did the right thing by it. We have this inscription, and I don't know whether anybody has... Uh, um, it does look like a chimney stack, does it not, if you've been in, in Calcutta to this day. When I first... When, when Lizzie and I, my wife and I, used to travel around India as sort of hippies, I remember seeing this thing and thinking it must be some sort of uh, brick factory. Um, and, and there it is, and of course it's a most wonderful monument. And it has techniques involved in terms of the polish, which are still unknown to this day. That it has a luster. It, has, it does look golden in certain lights. Uh, this is where we must ask about the third person, who is the hero of this tale really, because he builds upon everybody else's work, the work of his predecessors. Uh, and that is the first director, Right, of the Archaeological Survey of India, Alexander Cunningham, the, you know, whom, if you've read the book, and if, when you're going to read the book, well, save your best explanations for Alexander Cunningham. Yes, I, I, I have very mixed feelings about Alexander Cunningham. As any of you know, um, I'm so jealous of uh, your archaeology here. You know, we, um, anyone who studies archaeology in, in Britain, you go out to a muddy field, and you dig about in the ground, and if you're lucky, you find a, 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 a black, slightly blacker bit of ground where there was once a post hole. In other words, where a bit of wood was stuck in. And that's about the height of British archaeology. And, and yet you go to this country, and I've grumbled in this book about the way the ASI has not been protecting um, Ash Ashokan sites. But the fact is, there are so many of them in so many out-of-the-way places. 
One of my thrills, if I may say, has been to travel around India and to go to these out-of-the-way places and to find the most amazing uh, artifacts there. If I, can, if I can, may I bring up one example? Absolutely. Um, if you're at Bhopal next time, nobody knows about this in, in, in England, in India, or in England, of course. When you're in Bhopal next time, yes, of course, go to Sanchi. Now, Sanchi is hugely important because essentially this is where Ashoka's missionary program began. It's a, it's a, it's a memorial to the Ashoka's great Buddhist missionary program. And all around it are, the, are scattered the names of his missionaries, the relics there, the, uh, which are com uh, memorialized there. But go south till you come to the edge of the, I'm going to say the Aravali Hills, till you come to the to, to, um, Nirmada River. Uh, and what are the hills they're called? They're not the Aravali, the Vindhya Hills. Um, and you go round the corner into a little village called Pangoraria, and you can see a, a, a line of hills going deep into this wonderful valley. When we were there, a leopard was roaring literally below us. We were standing on a tumulus, and this leopard was returning to the kill, and it was roaring to us. Um, nevertheless, the point here is that there's a series of uh, rock shelters all the way up, extending for about 12 miles, some still unexplored. And we know that the earlier settlers of India came to those caves. Not far away is Bimbetka, which of course is now a world heritage site. Yeah. But nevertheless, not so far. I'm a bit further over to the east now here. And here in Pangararia, Ashoka put up one of his what are called minor rock edicts. Written, written on a very simple bit of rock, he says, two and a half years ago, I was a uh, upasaka. I was a follower of Sakya, but I was a very bad one. And, but now I'm much more serious about it. And now I am traveling around India to tell everybody about my good fortune. Now, uh, these, there are about 24 of these minor rock edicts. But what's special about this particular one is that just above it, hardly visible, Ashoka has, had, uh, Ashoka has brought in um, Somebody from the north, in fact, from Takshila. He's given his name to this inscription. So we know he's come from Takshila to, to, to inscribe this. New language. This is this new language of Ashoka Brahmi that Ashoka is using to spread and to unify India. Um, but above it, he's had tapped in very crudely, if I might read it to you, because it was the most, one of the most thrilling experiences I've had in India. On the rock face, very hard to reach. Somebody must have stood on somebody's shoulders to reach it. And they've tapped out these words in Ashokan Brahmi. Here we go. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, that's fine. Here we are. This is in, of course, what we might call Prakrit, the father of Sanskrit. Piyadasi Nama. You can work that out. This person called Piyadasi, beloved of the gods. Rajakumaras Eva. Well, exactly, you know what a Rajkumar is. Prince. When he was a prince. Sam Vasa Mane, Imam Desam Papanitha, Vihara Ate. It translates as follows very simply. The king Piyadasi, who is now called Piyadasi, when he was a prince, he came to this place while on tour together with his unwedded consort. In other words, Ashoka has come to this place. He's ordered this inscription and then he remembers that he came here with his girlfriend and he's added this little inscription on top. It's like saying, I was here. And that suddenly you realize this is a human being. Um, so go there and try and find it if you can. I was very cross at we, 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 when we were there that, in fact, the whole area was being used by rock climbers. <laughs> and alas, this is the paradox. What do we do with all these ancient monuments? Do we uh, allow, allow people to use them for rock climbing, or do we try to preserve them as ancient monuments? But remember, this is almost the first example of organized writing that we have in India. Yes, we can talk about what I would call the Saraswati civilization and the writing, but at the moment, we don't know what it is. We think it's lists of various organizations. We think it may be trademarks. Nobody yet has cracked that. But here we have this very sophisticated writing 
And the first evidence, the earliest evidence we have of India's writing. And of course, when you look at that and you look at modern Devanagari, you can see what's, how it's developed. For instance, the letter X. Everyone knows what ka looks like in Devanagari. And you can see that it originally starts as X. And then, of course, that's very plain, ka. Uh, ka is the foundation word. But if you add various diacriticals, it becomes ke, ko, ku, e, and so on. And you can see a very sophisticated language coming out of that, uh, a very sophisticated script developing, which you know, of course, is Devanagari. And here are some of the first examples. This is why, for me, it's so thrilling going on this journey of discovery with Ashoka. I've, I've said a bit now. I'm sorry. No, no, it's so interesting. What I wanted to ask was the, the third person in the trinity of the discovery of Ashoka, Alexander Cunningham, uh, was he the one who put it all together finally? Uh, yes, you're right. I mean, Alexander Cunningham, he's a disciple of uh, James Princep. Now, James Princep, sadly, he has six good years, and then he has uh, brain hemorrhage, and he dies. He, he actually he loses his mind, and he dies in England, in Belsize Square, just very near where I live now, in, in Hampstead. And uh, a brilliant and lovely man who more or less gets this little organization, the Asiatic Society of Bengal, he writes to everybody that he can think of, send me information about what you're finding in your area. And out of that, uh, you, you have this knowledge accretion uh, in Bengal and then gradually, of course, elsewhere, which starts this whole process of the recovery. And I should I just say again, just remember, this is hand in hand, again, chiefly with Brahmins, dare I say it, who are always acting as the intermediaries. And so you get this uh, wonderful, um, I would call it alliance, which actually helps to fire the Bengal Renaissance, if I can use that term. Somebody was very rude and I, the other day, I used the word Bengal Renaissance. All right, let's call it the recovery of the spirit of inquiry in Bengal, and the spirit of, of rebellion too, of course. Um, Cunningham. Cunningham. I have very mixed feelings. Here's an army officer who is a disciple of Princep, and he starts to do the first excavations. And the problem is that in doing those excavations, he does as much damage as, he, as, 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 as discovery. Sanchi is a wonderful example. He goes to this ruin on the hilltop. And if you haven't been to Sanchi, shame on you. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes. uh, uh, I, he, I'm sure Mr. Allen has something to tell us about the pillar of Heliodorus too. Oh, well, indeed. Which the locals call Kambaba and still do. It's not so far away. Mm -hmm. Yes, indeed. I mean, what a, who, who was this devotee of Vishnu? A Greek devotee of Vishnu called Heliodorus. What was he built this great big pillar at Vidisha outside Sanchi. <coughs> and so, you know, it, the, the locals take it for granted and call it Kam, which is pillar in Hindi, Kam Baba. But it's the English who come along and say, wait a minute, that's Greek. There was a yes, Greek here. Yeah. And I think this is one of the problems we have with somebody like Cunningham. He's always looking for two things. One, he's looking for examples of Muslim uh, iconoclasm. In other words, uh, Muslims uh, damaging various sites. And the other one he's looking for is Greek influence. And he finds Greek influence everywhere. You mentioned the Didaganj Yakshi. Yes. He would have thought that all oh, that must have been done by Greeks. The Indians mm -hmm. couldn't have done this. <laughs> and this is, this is a, a nuisance. The third, as I mentioned, the damage uh, um, he does. He goes to Sanchi and he digs straight down from the top to the bottom of every stupa and in the middle he finds relics. And it's hugely important, yes. He finds the, the relics of Moggallana uh, uh, Sariputta, the, the, the disciples of the Buddha. And he finds other names which tie up with uh, the missionaries who went to Nepal, the missionaries who go to Sri Lanka, and so on. So this is hugely important. Now, thank God, the ASI is doing its best. I've been very rude about the ASI. Uh, <clears throat> but the task it has is thankless. Um, and the other good news that's happening to me, uh, to now in India to me, is that the academics are starting to put pressure on the ASI so that their standards are, are improved. No, no. Uh, I, mean, I hope to, well, don't want to be critical, <laughs> but one fatal error has been made here is that you pay somebody to excavate, but you don't pay them to write up their reports. And so the danger here is that people excavate and they don't write their reports, and nobody knows what's happened. There, which is tragic. Uh, nevertheless, that's one of my bugbears. As I, I come back to the point 
uh, I'm so jealous of what's going on here that I wish I could play a part in it, but uh, there we go. What was very interesting also <coughs> in this book was that once the trail had been blazed and the persona of Ashoka, this incredible man, whoever he was, who tried so hard to be good after being so bad, you know, and, um, you know, but once the trail was blazed, more and more information that came in suddenly had a place to go. You know, there was a story to which to add the bits. An Indian archaeologist did a fair amount after independence. And in fact, just the other day, the Hindu reported the discovery of a Buddhist site at Nalgonda, which I'm sure all of you read in the paper. So the search goes on. Yeah. But, um, you know, what is so, I think, touching and interesting about this whole exercise, and this is something very typical of Mr. Allen when he, um, you know, chronicles, he's clearly fascinated by empires and emperors, but by the human beings, the ordinary lives of the men and women who, within that broad holding frame, if you think of his Raj stories, and much of that is happening in this book, you know, the individual stories, which are very touching to read. And when we come down to it, the, we see a personality that intrigues a human being who intrigues Mr. Allen as much as anybody else, who certainly intrigued the founding fathers of India. What I personally see is somebody who's trying a bit hard. He's doing a number of good things, but he also takes a dim view of um, party-loving uh, India, Indians and says, you're partying too much, you're eating too much, you're drinking too much, you should be good, you should be restrained. And he honestly, you know, after a bit, the edicts sound a bit boring and tiring. So it could be that um, the, the, the ideas that were being propagated, or rather the preachiness of Ashoka, perhaps didn't go down too well okay. with the uh, Hindu culture or Indian culture, since there wasn't any other culture at that moment. Um, the other thing that strikes me as an uh, impartial observer or a dispassionate observer is that um, the reason for um, Buddhism sort of starting with a bang and ending with a whimper in India could be that, I mean, you must try to imagine the, perfect, the frightful scenes that must have been enacted all over the upper Gangetic Plain when a group of men in orange came up and demanded uh, that you should give them your sons to take away, you know, take away active, productive, able-bodied members, men from society and have them retire as wandering bhikkhus and it would go, go around asking the others to feed them. Yeah. Meanwhile, who is going to do the work? So I think these might be some of the reasons that you could perhaps consider when you do your book again, which I'm sure you will. <laughs> You know, the, the Indian point of view on Ashoka, possibly, since all history is speculation, and we don't really know what happened, to go back to your Tolstoy quote. Um, I should like to ask uh, at this point, if we could ask the audience yes, yeah, uh, to yeah. ask Mr. Allen anything they like <laughs> about Ashoka and about this book. Yes. I just wanted to ask you, can you tell us something more about the evil? About? There's something more about the evil part. Well, I think the way it's been posited, uh, the, the subtext of this uh, talk, uh, which we have been delicately walking around, is that uh, India is a bad place. Uh, Indians are evil for chasing out such a good man. No, 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 no. Um, I, I've been very careful, I hope, not to, uh, well, no, it's not true, it's not possible. You can't hide, hide your own bias. Um, I, I have enormous respect uh, for a 5th century BC uh, philosopher who, came, who happened to be part of the Sakya clan. I have enormous respect for his ideas because I see him as a revolutionary. I was, I was uh, educated as a Marxist historian. Um, I like the idea of challenging orthodoxy. Um, and I like this man for challenging the orthodoxy of the time. That's not to say that one is right and one is wrong. But I do admire him for taking, uh, taking on that. For example, if I may quote one of his uh, from the Dhammapada, he says, you are not born a Brahmin, you become a Brahmin by your thoughts and your deeds and your actions. 
And the problem with that statement is that it strikes at the heart of Brahman, of, of, of I'm not going to use this horrid word caste, I hate it. Uh, I, I'd much sooner use. Yeah, uh, fine. Yeah? yeah? So, I mean, I think, I hope that makes my point. Uh, he's a revolutionary, and I find his ideas very exciting, and I think they have something to offer. But I would not for a minute also not say that um, Brahmanism has held this country together in an extraordinary way. I think um, the most extraordinary take home for us all from this book and what it's trying to say is that. Um, you know, is, is the point Mr. Allen just made about Ashoka trying to transcend the restrictions of a particular religion and moving on to a larger moral social code of operation to live by. Uh, that is definitely a point to take home in, in, in the context of that which must, you know, which we cannot help thinking of these days. More than anything else, it tells us that history will always surprise us. And so, the, if we had to, you know, uh, adopt a particular symbol as representative of our attitude, it should probably be the question mark, the Prashnium. Mr. Allen has questioned many things very well, and we thank him for putting together this wonderful read. And we thank you all for being here. And we'd like to ask if anybody has got a last question before we close the session. Please, ma'am. Uh, I just wanted to know, is there anything about his personal life? You know, it's like, um, how many wives he had on you, whatever, whatever. But that is not known about Ashoka. I mean, he, he much written about after, after James Prince had translated the edicts and so on and so forth. And we know he was a great king, first pan-Indian pan -Indian king and so on. Yes. But anything about his, you know, his personal life, he had, a, he had a wicked second wife. Mr. Allen talks a lot about her. Uh, I, think, I think part of the problem is that the main um, uh, trans, um, information we have about Ashoka, which is not written up by himself, comes with, I have to say it, Buddhist bias. Why not? It, it comes from the Mahavamsa and the Dipavamsa from Sri Lanka, and it comes from the Ashoka Vadana of the northern tradition, the Mahayana tradition, which survives in Tibet and so on. So we have two texts that are essentially written for Buddhist consumption, and we've always got to be very wary of that. But then again, what I've said it comes from consumption of the people that I'm writing for. So uh, again, I think, come back to my first point. Uh, Zen Buddhists in Japan, you know, there's a saying in Zen Buddhism, uh, if on, in your search for the Buddha, the Buddha stands in your way, kill the Buddha. And I think the same thing applies for, in history. That sounds like if, Nakirin. If in your search for the historical truth, history gets in your way, kill history. Uh, and I hope that doesn't sound like a paradox. Not at all. Paradox. It sounds very familiar to a Tamil audience, or an audience in South India. So. Well, on that uh, very uplifting note, I should like to thank you all, all over again. And perhaps before I uh, switch off the mic, I would like to briefly peek at, uh, you know, think of Rock Edict 1, where Ashoka, you know, all these are love letters to his people. And he says, what is dharma? A little evil and a lot that's good. The mahi isi kaidam. You know, cleanliness, purity, generosity, and a great many things. So he's still in question mode. And to understand somebody, you've got to actually hear what they're saying. And if you read Rock Edict 1, I think, which is actually my favorite Rock Edict, so that's my bias. So it just tells you all about the man, and then you can ignore the preachy bits later. Thank you all and a good evening.